Good morning. Welcome to this morning's Sunday service at Temple Baptist Church. We're so glad you have joined us. Look forward to ministering you today through music and the preaching of God's Word. I want to encourage you to follow along, your children and your family, and keep us in prayer certainly during these times. Let's have a word of prayer, and then Brother Worley will come with an opening song. Father, thank you for this beautiful morning you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have, though we're not in the church building, to meet together, Lord, as part of Temple Baptist Church. And Lord, as families, individuals here on this Sunday morning, we ask your blessing, Lord, and all that's done. Pray that, Lord, the music would encourage our hearts, draw us closer to you, prepare us for the preaching of your word. I pray, Lord, we'd pray along with different prayer requests that we hear for our church family and missionaries. Lord, I pray our Bibles would be open this morning. We'd follow along, take notes. Listen keenly, Lord, to the preaching of your word from Pastor Creed. Lord, thank you that uh, even though we are often at home and not able to meet together, Lord, in the church building, we can meet together as a church family. Lord, for those that may be uh, in different parts of the state or even around the world watching this broadcast, I pray you'd be an encouragement and a blessing. If there's any, Lord, that know not the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that they would come to know you, Lord, today. We love you. We thank you. May you be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to sing Have I Done My Best for Jesus. I hope you'll join me in singing there at your home. We're going to sing just a couple verses of Have I Done My Best for Jesus. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus, who died upon the cruel tree? To think of his great sacrifice at Calvary, I know my Lord expects the best from me. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me? No longer will I stay within the valley. I'll climb to mountain heights above. The world is dying now for want of someone to tell them of the Savior's matchless love. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me? All right, I want to thank all of you who prayed very much for the Washburns. I know many of you were uh, on that prayer list and a prayer phone call, and they made it safely over to Colorado. It was a long trip, about 22 hours, and they went straight there. Their son joined them about halfway, so thank you for many who prayed. The Washburns certainly appreciate that, and her father is doing much better, remarkable, and they said they can surely tell God's people have been praying and the possibility of him even going to rehab later this week, so thank you so much. Uh, the Washburns certainly appreciate your prayers very, very very much. We mentioned a few happy birthdays that we have coming up this week. I hope that you will reach out to these folks through a personal phone call, maybe a text, an email, a card in the mail. We have several birthdays as part of our church family. Miss Linda Jury, happy birthday. Her birthday is tomorrow. I hope that you'll let her know that. And we've got some young people with some birthdays coming up this week. We've got two birthdays on Tuesday. Jonathan Shields is six, and Jordan Lanning, I believe, is 16. Hopefully I'm right on that one, Jordan. And that is on Tuesday. And then one of our college students, Hannah Lankford, is turning 19 on Wednesday. So happy birthday to all of you. And uh, for our teenagers and anyone else in the church who participated in the online interactive youth rally last night, I hope it was a blessing to you, an encouragement. Hope that you have felt a little bit more connected with some different people there as you're at home. I appreciate Brother Fry and Servant's Heart, Brother Beal, and all those that put that on. And hopefully the Lord will be able to do something like that again. And then finally, don't forget, as was mentioned uh, last week about our new online giving. Some of you have already participated in that. Again, if you have any questions on that, you can certainly call one of the church staff. We'll let you know how that works. But just go on the website and click on the online giving. Uh, instructions are on there. It's pretty simple. Read everything there. It's an easy way for you to do that if you're not comfortable with mailing in your checks or dropping them by uh, the church. Thank you. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray for uh, some of these requests that were mentioned. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you help us now as we meet with you. I do pray that you'll help uh, the Washburns and uh, Lord, pray for Mrs. Washburn and, and her father and her mother during this time. Thank you so much for the answers to prayer. And uh, Lord, we give you all the glory and honor for that. Lord, I pray that you'll help um, Brother Carr uh, with his ankle, Lord, and, and all that he's going through in the pain there. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for the answered prayers for that, Lord. And I also pray for Brother Don Austin. Lord, thank you for bringing him back home. And Lord, I pray that you'll help uh, heal him. And Lord, there are many others that might be sick or uh, going through a rough time. Lord, I do pray that you'll help uh, Ms. Tabitha Hunter and her family. And the homecoming of her uh, grandmother, Lord, I pray that you'll help that family and just be with them. Lord, give us a great day around your word as we worship you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The man of sorrows died in agony. Struck once by God for my iniquity, he satisfied the Father's holy wrath and drank the bitter cup in my behalf. Constrained by Christ's atoning sacrifice, without reserve I offer him my life. Redeeming love compels me to proclaim the all-surpassing glory of his name. Resplendent in his royal majesty, my king still wears the scars of Calvary. His death wounds show the depth of selfless love, imploring me to live for things above. Constrained by Christ's atoning sacrifice, without reserve I offer him my life. Redeeming love compels me to proclaim the all-surpassing glory of his name. For him I count my life no longer mine. In his great work a higher call I find to lose myself and find my all in Christ. I follow on and gladly pay the price, constrained by Christ's atoning sacrifice. Without reserve, I offer him my life. Redeeming love compels me to proclaim the all-surpassing glory of his name. Redeeming love compels me to proclaim the all-surpassing glory of his name. Let's take the Word of God and turn to Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, and we're going to begin in verse number 17, Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. I want to challenge you uh, to get the Word of God. If you don't have a Bible nearby or present right now, I want to, I want to challenge you just to pause, uh, have somebody go get a copy of the Word of God and get it out and open it up, just like you were in church, and uh, turn to Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, and uh, verse number 17. Acts chapter 20, let's begin in, uh, in verse number 17. It says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I come into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed, uh, showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, 
repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And how and now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you, wherefore I take you to record this day and I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. We're going to take our text this morning from Acts chapter 20 and verse number 24. It says, but none of these things move me. And I want to ask you this morning this question, what moves you? What moves you? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this portion of Scripture, for your word, how true it is. Uh, Lord, how convicting it is. How comforting it is. Lord, thank you for your word. Speak to us this morning through your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we begin in Acts chapter 20 and verse 17, we have just learned of a miracle. A young fellow fell from uh, the third story window. And uh, Paul, by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, brought this young boy back from the dead, and, uh, and he, he lives, amen, and, and what a great miracle, and they saw the miracles, and then he began to travel, and uh, ended in a place called Miletus, which is a large city, quite a large city, and when he was there, uh, he, he beckoned or called for uh, the elders of Ephesus, and so uh, those pastors uh, or, or church leaders uh, to come to him, and uh, it was there, he was doing that to save some time, uh, but he really wanted to get a message from his heart. He had a message in his heart that God has given to him to the leaders of the church there in Ephesus, and, uh, and so we're going to go also to Ephesians chapter 4 today just to, just to kind of see what he had for these people in Ephesus uh, so, uh, in, in this letter to Ephesus. Uh, but one thing he says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24 catches my attention and has caught many people who preach this verse. This is one of the most preached verses in Acts. Uh, and in verse number 24, it says, But none of these things move me. But none of these things move me. I'm going to start preaching uh, from this portion of Scripture with this thought. Tonight, it's going to be the same thought. What moves you? We're going to start this morning. But what moves you? Uh, I want to ask you that question. What moves you? Now, I'm not talking about, hey, I'm hungry. I'm going to get up and move to the kitchen and get something to eat. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what motivates you. Uh, why do you wake up in the morning? When you wake up in the morning, what, is, 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 what excites you to do what you do? Uh, what, what motivates you? What gets your motor running to accomplish what you accomplish each day? What moves you? I want to say now, Paul says in, in verse 24 that he says, none of these things move me. Now what he's saying is, there are some things that do not move me. And he's dealing with that, and then tonight we are going to deal with some of the things that, that, that does not move Paul. And he, and he, and he uh, gives us those things in verse number 18 and 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. We see these things, that, that he says, these things, they don't move me. But I want to say that there is something that moves Paul. And by the way, there may be some things that don't move you, but I want to tell you there are some things that move you. There is something that moves you. There's something that moves you. And so the purpose of this, these messages is to help you identify in your life what moves you. What are you motivated by? What excites you to accomplish what you accomplish? What moves you? His name was Ed Spencer. 
and he was a student at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Ed was well known for his athletic abilities. In fact, he was one of the first Olympic athletes to win a gold medal for the United States of America. The college was situated right there on Lake Michigan. And one day, Ed Spencer was studying thoroughly for his classes in the library. He was interrupted by some of his friends who were, run to, or were running and, and uh, yelling his name. And as they got near, he could tell something was wrong. They said a ship called the Lady Elgin was thrown up against the rocks and people are drowning. Ed jumped up and ran down to the shore. Immediately he began to tear through the rough waters to save those that are drowning. One by one, Ed would grab someone and bring them to shore and save their life. And once they're secure with the others, he would dive back into the waters, the cold, rough waters that threw a ship against the rocks. And he would fight those waves out to the wreckage and save someone else. After about three or four people he saved, the people on the shore finally said, Ed, you need to stay here. Don't go back out. We don't want you to go back out. We don't want you to lose your life. You're going to lose your life. And he looked back and he said this, I have to do my best. I have to do my best. And he would go back out. And he'd bring another, another person in. He'd go back out and he'd bring another person in. Men, women, children. 17 of them he saved. On the last one, he, he brought back in, and he finally collapsed on the shore. He couldn't move. His life would never be the same. As he was laying on that shore, his friends surrounded him. He said, I did my best. I gave everything I had. And that he did. In fact, he would live his life as a semi-invalid because of that event. He gave everything he had. And so I'm asking you, what would move you to give everything you have to God? What would move you? What moved Ed? Ed saw people in trouble. Ed saw people drowning. Ed saw that there was a need there were people perishing, and what moved Ed was the fact that others needed him to survive. And I, as we look at Paul's life, we ask, what moved Paul? Well, what was that one thing that moved Paul uh, to do what he did? And I'm going to say this, just one word. Here's what moved Paul. Are you ready? The gospel. Gospel. One word. And that what moved Paul should move us. What moved Paul should move us. Uh, what is your mission? What is your cause? Is the gospel of Jesus Christ your mission? Uh, we see, first of all, Paul experienced the gospel through salvation. I want you to turn over to Acts chapter 9. This is the chapter uh, when Paul was converted. He was on his way on the road to Damascus. We remember that story, how Paul was on his way to Damascus. He wasn't there sightseeing. He wasn't there on vacation. He was on his way to Damascus. What was he going to do? He was going to persecute Christians. He, he was there uh, to go against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was interrupted uh, someone interrupted Paul's life. He was interrupted by Jesus Christ. He was interrupted by the gospel. And in Acts chapter 9, look at verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. And verse 2, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men, listen to this, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. He didn't care if they were men or women. He's going to bring them as, as, uh, as prisoners. Boy, what a mindset. Look, look at verse number 19. 
So that, that was Saul. In verse number 19, we see a new creature. It says, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. And then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And straightway, he preached Christ in the synagogue, that he is the Son of God. What happened? What was the difference when, when Saul was on his way to take men and women who were Christians, men and women who, who accepted the gospel as a lifestyle, who accepted Jesus Christ, he was there to drag them to prison as prisoners. He was there to disrupt the preaching of Jesus Christ. What changed? Here's what changed. Paul experienced the gospel. Paul met Jesus. Paul met Jesus. What an interesting thought. What an interesting thought. And, and what I'm asking here this morning is, have you met Jesus? H has the gospel become part of your life through salvation? Do you know for sure if you were to die today where you'd spend eternity? If you have not been moved to salvation through the gospel, I want to challenge you right now to accept Christ as your personal Savior. I want to challenge you to make that decision. The gospel of Jesus Christ is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and, and wherein ye stand. He says this in verse 2, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And Paul's saying this, he's saying, listen, I gave you the gospel. And if you believe the gospel, you got saved. Here's the gospel that Jesus Christ died for you. And he was buried, and on the third day he rose again. There's the gospel. He said, Pastor Creed, what must I do? You must understand that Jesus loves you. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. That's you. God loves you. You also need to understand that you were born with a sin nature. Romans 3, verse 10, there is none righteous, none at one. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I want you to understand you have fallen short of God. Uh, there's no way that you can get to God other than Jesus Christ. Understand the consequences for your sin. Now, Jesus does love you, but you're a sinner. You were born that way. There's a consequence for that. A consequence is found in Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin. That's a consequence. That's the payment for your sin, for, for your sin nature, is death. Eternal separation from God. See, uh, uh, a, a physical death is, is a soul separating from your body. There's separation there. Uh, the second death is what we call it. You will experience a second death if you're not saved, and that means your, your body and soul will separate, and then your soul will separate from God into an eternal hell. I don't want that to happen. I don't want you to experience hell. I want you to accept Christ as your personal Savior because he paid it all. You don't have to go to hell. Uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, well, listen to this, Christ died for us. You do not have to experience hell. You can live in your, in your eternity. You can live in, for eternity in heaven. Understand that we must make a choice. A choice is yours. I, I was not born in this world and then elected that, that I got saved. That's not how it works. If, if that's, uh, some, somebody says, well, that's, that's how I believe it works, and you don't believe the Bible. It's a choice. 
Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 tells us it's a choice. If you want to accept Christ as your personal Savior today, you can. But you have to make that choice. Paul said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. And Paul, on the road to Damascus, put his faith and trust on Jesus Christ. He repented. Jesus Christ changed him. He was a new, he's a new creature. We see that Paul experienced the gospel through salvation. That was the beginning for Paul. And let me say this. Once you experience the gospel through salvation, something changes in your life. There ought to be an excitement that is refreshing every day, knowing that you have eternity today, that that you you have an eternal soul, that you won't be separated from God, that you have a home in heaven. How exciting is that? The gospel. But then Paul committed his life to God by surrendering to preach the gospel. Number two, Paul committed his life to God by surrendering to preach the gospel. Uh, In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you. And we can go, we can go uh, country by country, city by city, town by town, everywhere Paul went, he preached the gospel. And Paul was not shy about preaching the gospel. By the way, you say, Pastor Cree, what does this mean? I want you to look at verse uh, number 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I myself dear, my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He was committed and moved by the gospel. Wherever, wherever he could go and preach the gospel, that's where he went. What moved Paul was the gospel. He was saved by the, by the gospel. He surrendered to preach the gospel. By the way, it was about Jesus, not Paul. Preaching the gospel was about Jesus Christ. It wasn't about him. Uh, Look at verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Uh, What does that mean? Uh, uh, Humility is the absence of pride. Humility is the absence of pride. And Paul said, listen, I, I had to get rid of pride in my life. I had, to, I had to get ready. If I was going to preach the gospel of Christ, if I was going uh, to have an impact uh, in this world, I had to get rid of pride in my life, and it had to be about Jesus and not about Paul. Verse 24, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto me. You see, his commitment was to a person, not a place. His commitment was to a person, not a program. His commitment was to a person, not a political party. His his commitment was to a person, not the power of money. His commitment was to Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. It was about Jesus, not Paul. It was about others, not Paul. We see, neither I count I my life dear unto me. The last part of that is to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The ministry of Jesus Christ must continue through the ministry of the local church. Did you catch that? Now, Jesus Christ came and lived 33 years and, and had a ministry of Jesus Christ, and he died for us. But when he died, his ministry did not die. The gospel still carries on. See, Jesus Christ's ministry must continue through the ministry of the local church. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? You, the local church. Jesus Christ's ministry will continue through you. How's that? Allow the gospel to move you. Surrender your life. Surrender your life to preach the gospel to others. We are committed to preaching the gospel. But we are committed to preaching the gospel in love. I want you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I want you to look at verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, the, the uh, letter to the church there in Ephesus 
It says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Uh, there's a reason that God has done what he's done. This, there's a reason there's a plan put in place. There's a reason Christ established the local New Testament church, which we are. And what is that reason? It's a gospel-centered reason. To get the gospel to every creature. Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by, by the slight of men and, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait and, de and deceive, to deceive. What, what's going on here? That the gospel is passed down through the church to the community, to the world. And as we see people uh, saved, they are to mature. Not just children tossed to and fro, but to mature and to mature Christians and complete Christians. How does that happen? Look at verse number 15, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. It says this, But speaking the truth in love. See, if the gospel is going to move us to preach the gospel, if the gospel is going to move you, you must speak the truth in love. Well, Pastor Creed, I speak the truth, and they need to hear the truth. You speak in vain if it's not speaking the truth in love. You see what I mean, Pastor Creed? You cannot speak the gospel without speaking it in love. The gospel is the greatest love story of all time. And the only way to preach the word of God, the only way to preach the gospel is to preach it with love and speaking the truth in love. The gospel is given to us by the book of love, the word of God, a love letter to us. The gospel is about the greatest, uh, lo greatest God, the, the greatest love, of all time, an agape love, an agape love, an eternal love, an overcoming love. For God so loved the world. But God committed his love toward us. And so we can't preach the truth without love, but we can't love without the truth. Isn't that something? Now you try that. You see, people that love without, the people that love, but they don't tell people the truth, they don't love. They love themselves. They don't love them. If a doctor came in here and I had cancer and, he, and then I went to the doctor, the doctor came into the room and said, uh, look, everything's okay. Now, he knew I had cancer, but he did not want, he did not want to tell me that I had cancer. He loved me too much to tell me that I had cancer. And it was bad news, and he didn't want to bear bad news to me. A doctor, that doctor loves himself. More than he loves me. See, if he loved me, he'd tell me the truth. And we need to speak the truth in love. That's the gospel. The gospel. That, hey, you're a sinner, and there, there is a hell, and real people go to hell. But there is a Christ that loves you. I want you to see, thirdly, Paul lived a gospel-centered life. He lived a gospel-centered life. He experienced salvation. He experienced the gospel through salvation. He, experienced, he preached the gospel. He surrendered his life. But he also lived a gospel-centered life. He started really living at salvation. He started preaching the gospel to, as a witness, and he started living the gospel directed by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse number 24 again. But none of these things move me, neither count I myself dear, uh, my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my, my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. Everything we have to do for Christ, we received by Christ. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
A, Christ, a, a, a gospel-centered life is a life that is always pointing to Jesus Christ. A gospel-centered life is a life that's always preaching Jesus Christ. A gospel-centered life is a life that's always practicing in obedience to Jesus Christ. A gospel-centered life is, is a life that is consistent in prayer to Jesus Christ. A gospel-centered life is a life that has a passion to please Jesus Christ and to see the lost saved. Now, this was the life of Paul. Paul did not speak to be heard. Paul spoke to be repeated. We ought to do the same. When I began, I told you of an Ed Spencer. A man by the name of Ensign Edwin Young heard of the story of Ed Spencer. How he saved those 17 lives. He heard of Ed he gave his own life to save them, the lives. And, and Young then began to pen the famous song, the song that we sang this morning. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? Who died upon the cruel tree to think of his great sacrifice at Calvary. I know my Lord expects the best for me. The hours I have wasted are so many. The hours I've spent for Christ so few because of all my lack of love for Jesus. I wonder if his heart is breaking too. I wonder, have I cared enough for others? Or have I let them die alone? I, I might have helped a wonder to the Savior. The seed of precious life I might have sown. No longer will I stay within the valley. I'll climb to mountain heights above. The world is dying now for want of someone to tell them of the Savior's matchless love. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I, I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me. I want to ask you, does the gospel move you? It ought to. It ought to move you to obey Christ, to preach his word. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to open our hearts to be moved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.